Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 18th issue of Chewbacca Chats. We are really happy to have with us today Jane Bianco, who is curator at the Farnsworth Art Museum in Rockland, Maine. Uh, since 2008, Jane has researched and organized painting, photography, drawings and print, textiles, architectural and other art historical exhibitions, and written accompanying catalogs, including the one we're talking about today, Elliot Porter, All the Wild Places. In, uh, she published that in 2020. Uh, Jane holds a bachelor's in fine arts in graphic design from Boston University and a master's in art history with a concentration in material culture from the University of Wisconsin, Madison. Jane, welcome to Trabaco Chats. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, I will just launch in. Um, and I'm, this is the first time, everyone, that I've done a Zoom, uh, a PowerPoint via Zoom. So forgive me, my mouse is very sensitive um, if, it, <laughs> if it gets away from me. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure you have a, uh, a very understanding audience, Jane. I, I, I do it. hope so. Um, and thank you very much uh, for, for joining the chat today. Um, we do have an Elliot Porter show up at the Farnsworth. And um, as you may know, the Farnsworth is open to reservations on a timed basis. So you can, um, if you are interested, see the Porter show uh, before the end of the year or it is going to extend through the end of the year. Um, and I would just say that there's nothing like standing face to face with a piece of artwork. So though I do hope the images come through on this uh, presentation, um, I think seeing the, the work um, in front of you is even better. Um, <clears throat> Elliot Porter was uh, 1901, 1990, um, he's known for his role in establishing color photography as an important art form. That may not sound like anything much to us, we're all so used to color photography, but he was an early pioneer uh, in the use of color photography. He's known particularly and all throughout his life for his bird photographs and for his color uh, photographs that span the globe and reveal uh, what I say are nature's wondrous configurations of layer and pattern. His photography was interwoven with his approach as a naturalist um, as he traveled and throughout the world between New England and the Southwest where he, li he lived in New England in the summer, Southwest the rest of the year as he was an adult, the Baja Peninsula to Iceland, China, Antarctica, the Galapagos Islands, and to Africa, focusing his lens increasingly on nature's details within a changing landscape. It was his uh, imagery as well as his fabulous writing, uh, which he <clears throat> engaged in both, uh, first published in a series of Sierra Club books in the 60s that helped launch global interest in the conservation movement. Um, but he stated that he never would have been a good photographer had he gone out to photograph solely for a cause. Rather, I believe his images are reflections of his curiosity and his pure delight in the beauty of the places where he found himself. In 1939, uh, he gave up a burgeoning career, a successful career, as a researcher in microbiology and biochemistry at Harvard and a teacher to turn full time to artistic photography, spurred on by a successful one man exhibition of his work at the Alfred Stieglitz renowned and American Place Gallery. This is 1939, black and white uh, photographs. Um, again, he initially uh, concentrated on photographing birds close up. 
And in the show, we have marvelous home movies um, uh, through the uh, graciousness of, of David Porter and the um, Northeast to Start Film Archive. These are silent films, but you can see in the exhibition, Elliot Porter setting up all his equipment uh, in various uh, three different short excerpts. Quite interesting. Um, however, when his highly regarded bird photographs done in the 30s um, were refused for publication because the publishers felt that the birds could not be distinguished enough in black and white, their plumage, um, that's what prompted him to go to explore color film. Uh, and I thought I'd start with a lovely color photograph of a place you may know being um, in the audience. I'm assuming there are a number of you from MDI and you may recognize this as, as Bass Harbor, uh, an estuary in Bass Harbor, um, formerly known as McKinley, if I have that right. And uh, Elliot Porter's title is Title Marsh McKinley, done in 1965. And because I don't know MDI as well as you do, I needed to know where this was. Um, I found an old postcard here, easily online. And um, because of the outline of the mountains in the background, uh, which Tim has, has given me the names of them and I promptly forgot them, um, you can see the, the parallel between uh, Porter's 1965 photograph and this postcard, which may have been done in the 30s, I'm, I'm guessing. Ruth and James Porter, um, the parents of Elliot Porter, had five children, Nancy, Elliot, Edward, Fairfield, and John, born in that order. And you see Elliot on the far left and his brother, Fairfield Porter, the painter, next to him. Uh, Elliot and Fairfield were very close. And later in life, uh, the painter admitted to his brother that his own work had been influenced by his photography, an acknowledgement that Elliot Porter deeply treasured. As they were growing up, the five Porter children enjoyed private tutors, fine schools, reading concerts, museums, and extensive travels from their home near Chicago. The family eventually purchased Great Spruce Head Island in Penobscot Bay, just off the coast of the familiar area to all of us of Maine. Whoops, that's the mouse being sensitive. Okay. Um, so then I thought it would be uh, interesting to see the distance between Bass Harbor and Great Spruce Head Island. Great, Great Spruce Head Island um, on the left in the little square, uh, as you can see, it's not too far from uh, North Haven and Islesboro. Um, and all the porters were avid boaters. In fact, Stephen Porter, this well-known sculptor, uh, Elliot Porter's son, has built boats. And I suspect um, that Elliot Porter boated out to, and here I'll use the cursor if it shows up, I'm not sure. Uh, I believe he boated from Great Spruce Head Island around uh, Deer Isle and Stonington, which he was an area which he was very familiar with, shot a lot of photographs there, and made his way up to MDI through Bass Harbor. Um, by boat, I suspect. Uh, these photographs are taken by me out on Great Spruce Head Island last autumn uh, when I was honored to be able to pay a visit there. The inside of the a great house is a setting that some of you may be familiar with through Fairfield Porter's paintings. And as I gazed out the window from the dining room at some point, this fabulous four is it? Schooner sailed by 
Um, it's a very magical place. I can understand why the family went year after year to uh, Great Spruce Head Island and how it influenced uh, the brothers. And that includes John Porter as well, whose films you can see in the uh, exhibition. Reached only by boat and crisscrossed by footpaths made by their father, the island, this magical place, was uh, a place of woodlands, fields, rocky shorelands, and homes for birds. Features that had a profound effect on all the Porter children and on the artistic uh, visions in particular of both Elliot and Fairfield Porter. So you see, of course, Elliot Porter photograph on the left, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, Fairfield Porter painting on the right, both in the Farnsworth collection. And both showing the shoreline. And there's a close up <coughs> of our picture that it's kind of the title piece for the catalog and the show. <clears throat> and what Elliot Porter said about the island was that our lives there, my brothers and sisters and mine, were from the very first determined by the sea. High tide was the time to swim and low tide the time to explore the shore. And their father was an avid naturalist himself and instilled in all of his children a great uh, appreciation and curiosity about the natural world. So here is uh, Elliot Porter as a young man setting up his tripod in order to photograph birds in their natural settings, usually nesting birds on Great Spruce Head Island. Whoops. Whoa. <laughs> okay. I don't know how to get this to go back. Oh, I, I think maybe, uh, Jane, I think maybe you press the play button so that it's running automatically. And if you, uh, um... you know, I got this really sensitive. <laughs> this, okay. There he is in, um, in the Southwest. He had a home as an adult uh, where he raised his own family in Tesuque outside of San, uh, San, Santa Fe. The best of two worlds, right? Maine and New Mexico. So here <clears throat> I'm showing um, how beautiful his black and white photographs were of birds. And here his color photography as it emerged with bird photography. And what's interesting to me in both of these are, are the compositions and particularly in the color picture. You see how the, the birds are nestled in their haven of a nest uh, between the pattern that the, the fur um, makes all around them. It, it's, it couldn't be a better painting. This is the um, shed, now a little cottage on the island, um, also my photograph, where Elliot Porter produced his print, uh, printed dye transfer uh, color prints. And I can read to you um, something I don't understand very well because I haven't done it myself or not, or perhaps we can leave it to the question and answer period <clears throat> about the masks and the dye transfer process. But this is where he, he worked. And Stephen Porter, again, his son, the sculptor, also um, observed his father doing the dye transfer process. And he thought it was quite amazing as the colors emerged. The Amon Carter Museum in Fort Worth, Texas, houses uh, the bulk of Elliot Porter's work and his archives, masses of, of uh, photographs and materials. Um, 25,000 transparencies and over 7,000 dry dye transfer prints are housed at the Amon Carter Museum. It's a, a wonderful resource uh, for researchers and those who just appreciate his photographs. And you can go online, find out a lot about Elliot Porter at the Amon Carter Museum archives. This is a, a 
I'm going to try not to talk too much because I think the, the photographs speak for themselves. This was a gift from Stephen Porter and his wife, Marcia, to the Farnsworth, Great Spruce Head Island, looking down. Though um, in the scenes of woodlands on his main island, Elliot Porter's photographs imply permanence. These places uh, have been altered over time. And on the island, um, he, he noticed a diminishing bird population. And as well, the stands of trees have been windswept and fallen and, and changed over the years. This very, very famous photograph of which the Farnsworth has a print was uh, taken by Elliot Porter on a four, at a four by five inch format. And it was blown up by Ansel Adams to a five foot high print. Uh, this is the uh, front and center uh, beginning of our show at the Farnsworth. In 1972, Elliot Porter was preparing for a retrospective exhibition of his work at the University of New Mexico in uh, Art Museum in Albuquerque. And he asked Ansel Adams, whom he knew, um, if he would enlarge his print to monumental scale. A feeling that perhaps Ansel Adams was the only photographer in America with the technical ability to do this sort of thing. Um, Adams had been making large scale prints and photo murals uh, in the late 1930s um, during the WPA era for various projects relating to his work for the Department of the Interior. So he was well equipped to do this. And he did make five monumental scale black and white prints from the, from the Elliot Porter negative. However, despite their lifelong friendship and common interests in conservation and photography, Ansel Adams maintained an aversion to color photography. And as Elliot Porter quoted in his autobiography, Adams felt it was too literal to be an art form too much information. Um, Elliot's childhood spent exploring Great Spruce Head Island and other nearby islands, um, as you may recall from the map in Penobscot Bay, first inspired him to seek out other unspoiled places as an adult. As his son Stephen has noted, the island was one of the great influences of his life. How could it not have been? Uh, most of us may know his photographs uh, through a series of copy table size books, uh, first published by the Sierra Club in the 60s and over the decades by other publishers during his lifetime and beyond. There are more than 30 books published with the writings, the fabulous writing, as well as the fabulous photographs of Elliot Porter. And these are, are just a sampling. Porter was reading the books and journals of Henry uh, David Thoreau in the 30s. And he was marking passages that he felt related to his photography. He was, he was developing a, a, an emotional and an aesthetic um, feeling for his, his work, even as he was consumed with the technicalities. He amassed a series of photographs and in 1959 exhibited some of the pairings of Thoreau, quotes from Thoreau, um, as well as with his images at the George Eastman House in Rochester, Rochester, New York. At that time, his work came to the attention of conservationist David Brower, director of the Sierra Club. And two years later, Brower had raised the funds to publish a book that Elliot Porter had envisioned. In Wildness is the Preservation of the World became the first of his nearly 30 books published over his lifetime. Um, 
And this book, um, it, it, I consider it a classic, uh, marked a turning point in the acceptance of fine art color photography. And it has personally had a profound effect on my own creative vision. And here, um, if you can see a bit of the quote um, from which the title was extracted from uh, Thoreau's essay on walking. In Wildness was published soon after Rachel Carson's revelations in her book, Silent Spring, published just a few months before this one, uh, of the harm wrought by dependence upon pesticides, another um, author related to me. In the preface to this book, um, Elliot Porter wrote that through his photographs, I hope to be able to complement in feeling and spirit Thoreau's thinking a hundred years ago and to show the peril we face even more today by our faster destruction of life, not our own. Um, on view in the, in the Farnsworth exhibition are three portfolios from our collection in their entirety. Uh, over his lifetime, um, Elliot Porter put together 12 or more portfolios with various publishers. And um, it's wonderful to see these photographs. Thanks to the Friends of the Farnsworth Collection, a group established to provide funds for the museum to publish works of American art with an uh, emphasis on artists who lived and worked in Maine, we were able to acquire these three portfolios. And so I'll give you um, a bit of a taste of a few, some of the images from the portfolios and hopefully not talking too much here. Um, this is uh, near Great Barrington, Massachusetts, a place I know very well. Um, who has not walked through a pathway in Maine woods similar to this one? Um, it is Path in the Woods, Great Spruce Head Island, 1981. Hawkweed in the Meadow. Great Spruce Head Island, 1968. Maple Leaves and Pine Needles, uh, Tamworth, New Hampshire, 1956. And again, keep in mind, um, Elliot Porter not only photographed these, but he did his own color prints. Glen Canyon is a special case. Um, it was another um, issue that was taken up by the Sierra Club. During the 1950s, plans were made to harness water from the upper Colorado River for irrigation projects for ranchers in Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming, and for dams to provide uh, water storage and release to downstream to Arizona, California, and Nevada. Um, while some of the, these dam projects were dropped, uh, Glen Canyon Dam was not. <clears throat> so in collaboration with the Sierra Club, Porter compiled his photographs uh, taken along the Colorado River as the place no one knew. And copies of the book were sent to uh, President Lyndon Johnson and his secretary, of the interior steward Udall at the time, as well as every member of Congress with a plea not to implement the, the Glen Canyon Dam. However, of course it, it was. And the damming uh, created uh, Lake Powell, which began filling in 1963 and completed in 1980. Um, at capacity storage, the lake has uh, 26 million acre feet of water. This is Escalante River Outwash, Glen Canyon, 1962. And I think you, as you see these photographs, you, you begin to see the abstract nature of his compositions. Um, I think this is worth reading. 
um, because it, it it speaks to um, his feeling for um, as a scientist, as a naturalist, and as an artist. Porter eventually made 11 raft trips on the Colorado River and um, conveyed uh, his first reactions to the beauty of the area in this, in this quote. I hope I've given you enough time to read it. Some of these pictures actually, well, they make me gasp because of the vivid color and, and the, the, the color, the forms and the color, just because of the color and the forms, the juxtaposition, the arrangement of forms, and it's all natural. Uh, this is the San Juan, along the San Juan River in Utah in 1962. Uh, reflections in a pool, Indian Creek, Escalante River, Utah. He worked with a two and a quarter inch camera uh, while rafting, uh, which is his means of transport along the Colorado, and a four by five inch camera on land. He portrayed the canyon's rock faces, water, and plants in over a thousand images captured during 11 trips to the area. He visited twice in 62, 63, 64, 65, 68, and then in 1971, altogether 11 trips. And in two rafting trips in, in 1961, uh, painter Georgia O'Keeffe accompanied him she sketched while he photographed and he wrote i remember how she liked looking out looking up out of slot canyons and caves at holes in the sky so she was seeing the abstract nature along the way as well and this is the edge uh, the river's edge uh, along the uh, glen canyon courseway water slide taken from above. It's hard to gauge the scale of this. His, I do believe his photographs um, exceeded their documentary value um, in revealing the canyon's forms and services of abstract patterns and of water, rock, and light intermixed. Certain passages, um, was published in 1989, the portfolio of, of images. Um, and I do believe it's a kind of, towards the end of his life, it's a kind of summing up of places he loved as a photographer during his life. And something he wrote um, as, a, as a preface to this book, I feel is very important his emphasis of love for his subject matter uh, above, above the medium of photography. So I think he felt that way about the birds and I think he felt that way about the greater world. Foxtail grass um, along the Colorado River, 1976. Um, 1967, Grand Canyon. And what I notice about these two photographs uh, juxtaposed, um, just forgetting about their subject matter, is again, the sort of emphasis on the curves and the edges of things. Water streaked wall, um, Lake Powell, after the water had risen, 1965, or as it was rising, excuse me. And then juxtapose from the same portfolio with Aspen's um, taken in 1959, um, the emphasis on the vertical patterns of tree trunks and of streaks in a canyon. And then um, Bracken and Hawkweed and his, um, image of the apple tree shown from at the very beginning of this presentation, um, which I 
I, I think it's a sort of a visual interplay of patterns and textures, which I find rather fascinating. The subtle pattern on pattern between the apples against the leaves and the ferns against the bracken in the field. And here um, from the same portfolio, Gray's Arch and Birch Tree, a uh, Gray's Arch, Kentucky and Birch Trees in the Adirondacks. Um, the more you, or at first, for me anyway, I, it was very hard for me to distinguish on the left in Gray's Arch, which trees were in the foreground and which were in the background. And somehow the background came towards the foreground. Um, the images, some of the images he takes play with that. Um, they're sort of disorienting. Again, I, I mentioned it's hard to tell scale, but sometimes it's hard to tell what's what. And I think that's part of the fascination once you're drawn into his photographs. It's not just the obvious details, but it's what it does not only to your eyes, but to your, to your psyche. His photographs are really multi-layered. And this one, um, uh, I can imagine that the tree is trying to escape from the woods around it. It's just bursting in color and standing out from all the rest. All kinds of analogies you can make there. And then um, I do believe that his Glen Canyon photographs, one on the right, for example, um, played a part in inspiring his travels to really far-flung realms, including Antarctica. As a scientist and as an artist both, he knew the underlying forces that created what he was looking at. He understood cellular and crystalline networks, surface tensions, chemical, mechanical, and evolutionary changes causing structural and optical nuances. Not only did he observe this, but he, he played with this in his um, aesthetic compositions. His photography emphasized the beauty of the complex. And here, this one, so hard to tell what is the foreground, what is the background? Is that an ocean in between? No, it's a hillside of snow. Those are layers and layers of distance um, that we're looking at, snow-covered hills and mountains with the far distant um, smokiness um, on the mountains in the far, far distance. And here, the colors just sort of relegated to blue and yellow. It's just amazing. And he wrote about two trips to Antarctica. Uh, they're riveting books. Roughly twice the size of Australia, the Antarctica is cold, windy, and dry. Um, the average temperature ranges from 14 to 76 degrees Fahrenheit. I didn't know it got that hot. But more recently, 80% um, of the glaciers along the West Coast have retreated in the last 50 years, with most of these showing an accelerated retreat or melt in the last dozen years. And it was um, between the, the summer time, between December and February, that he took these photographs of Antarctica. This is a photograph taken in February this year. Satellite images of Landsat 8 photos on um, the northern tip of the Antarctica Peninsula that stretches towards South America. Uh, two days after the first photo was taken, the area hit 65 degrees Fahrenheit pretty early in the year. And it, that temperature <clears throat> coincidentally matched the day's temperature in Los Angeles. This is Antarctica. NASA said the warm spell caused widespread melting on nearby glaciers. And NASA 
expanded. Such persistent warmth was not typical until the 21st century in Antarctica, and it has become more common as the years go by. Antar the Antarctic Peninsula at the northwestern tip near South America is one of the fastest warming areas of, of the world. So last fall when I was visiting uh, Great Spruce Head Island um, where the family made their home each summer since 1912, the journal Science, Science was also publishing um, concurrently, the findings of a 50 year study of bird species, 529 bird species by seven international institutions, concluding that on the American continent, the bird population has diminished by an unprecedented scale. Um, since Elliot Porter was making his bird photographs. But even in his lifetime, until he died uh, from, from 1901 until 1990, he was noticing the diminishing uh, bird, singing bird population just on Great Spruce Head Island. So here he is, a young man with his uh, large format camera. And just to sum up, he was a doctor, he was a researcher, he started out as a scientist. His father instilled in him an appreciation for the natural world, and in that sense, he was a, a natural naturalist. Um, the aesthetic factors um, entered into his photography once he went into color. And um, in both cases, I believe, his bird photographs and his landscape photographs uh, were because of his love of the world around him and that these uh, things in this world inspired his own photographic uh, images, his own photographic documents of discovery. Thank you. Well, Jane, that was magnificent. I uh, am uh, just in awe of the images you, you showed us and the, his, create, his creative drive and his expertise, it's just fascinating. We, um, we fielded lots of questions. I want to welcome our viewers from the world of the Farnsworth Art Museum. I think there's many people perhaps who are connect, more strongly connected with the Farnsworth rather than the Mount Desert Island Historical Society, oh, but we're very great. glad you're here. And um, we don't have time for uh, all the questions, but uh, there's one that one or two that really uh, strike me. And one is, um, what was the most rewarding part of working on the Porter Show? Um, I would say it was getting to know members of the Porter family and realizing um, the, the sort of the legacy within that family um, and the rever uh, that had been passed down from now, it would be their, their grandfather um, to a generation now in their 70s um, and then their children uh, and their children. Um, a reverence for Great Spruce Head Island and uh, for this part of Maine. Um, that's really what had the most impact uh, on me most recently. Further into the past, uh, when I was, um, when I spoke about in wildness is the preservation of the world changing my, or having an impact on me, um, it was because after seeing that book as a teenager, I, on my own rambles through the woods, I started to see, if this doesn't sound too presumptuous, I started to see the world through Elliot Porter's eyes and that has never left me. One of the things I do on walks is look down, partly so I don't trip, but also because the patterns of what lies beneath us are so fascinating. Those microcosms are, to me, some of the most uh, beautiful scenes that I'll ever see. And I think it was because Elliot Porter recognized those himself. It was the details of nature that he brought to the fore um, in his, mainly through his books because they were popularized and people like me um, could just look at them growing up, yeah. Well, um... 
Unfortunately, we're out of time. We'd field more questions, but let's finish, Jane, with uh, telling our viewers where they can learn more. Oh, you must seek out his books. Um, just Google Elliot Porter. Um, his writing is magnificent. His photographs, even better. But come to the Farnsworth. Um, you can come on uh, reserved and time tickets um, to see the show throughout the end of the year. Um, as I said in the beginning, there's nothing like standing in front of an Elliot Porter photograph. And these are all large format, 16 by 20 uh, for the most part. And then the Ansel Adams, the five foot high, um, black and white, you feel as though you're standing in the trees. Well, thank you, Jane. This was just a wonderful presentation. I'm so glad that uh, we were connected so that we could present this to a new audience. And I want to invite everyone back for another issue of Tobacco Chats next Thursday at 4.30. The Executive Director of the Mount Desert Island Historical Society, Rainy Bench, will inter interview Carolyn Repkevian the executive director of the Bar Harbor Historical Society. And they'll, they'll talk uh, uh, leader to leader about uh, some of the wondrous uh, objects and fav uh, Carolyn's favorites at the Bar Harbor Historical Society. So I hope you can join us again, either on this uh, Zoom connection, the link is the same every, uh, every week, or you can uh, connect through with us through Facebook Live. Once again, thank you all for joining us and especially to you, Jane. It was a real pleasure to work with you this week and to see this presentation. Thanks. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Bye-bye.